Now we're going to be looking at reproduction in angiospermophytes. And if you remember your plants, then you remember there's different types. There's coniferophytes, bryophytes, philocenophytes, and angiospermophytes. And I like to think of angiospermophytes as angel sperm. Only angel sperm could produce beautiful flowers. And that's why angiospermophytes are called flowering plants. They're called flowering plants. So let's look at everything there is to know about uh, plants and flowering. So there are male and female parts. You should know all of this. Uh, should be pretty straightforward from labeling uh, basic parts of a flower like you've been doing since you were a kid. The petals, sorry for the handwriting, everything. Uh, here's the male parts over here. Uh, male parts are the anther, which contains the pollen and the filaments. The female main parts, uh, something right here, the stigma and the style. This is a typical flower arrangement, but you'll notice that um, usually the female parts are either higher or they're tucked away or they, uh, what's the word, bloom? That's nah, probably not the right word. They only become available during certain times uh, to prevent this flower from actually self-pollinating. So in this case, if there's pollen here and the pollen actually falls, it's not going to actually fall onto this plant here. And we're going to rely on our pollinators, birds, um, and insects to come help us do all of that. Um, other things, the sepals down here are just some of the first leaves that are supporting the flower. And the ovary, um, we're going to talk a little bit later about what happens when the pollen actually lands here. But anyways, remember this is a dicot plant, a dicot plant. And these are the things that you have to be able to label. Look at all the beautiful flowers over here and this one that is pulsating. Fantastic. These three terms, pollination, fertilization, and seed dispersal, are not to be confused with each other. Um, they all deserve a full video. And go watch that uh, David Attenborough BBC uh, documentary called The Private Life of Plants to learn all about this stuff in cool slow motion video. That's what made me really interested in all this stuff. So you could take a guess, look at my little pictures here, pollination, there's a little bee, it's going to do something. This is going to help to actually... Uh, Transfer pollen from one flower to another. That's what this guy is doing up here. Fertilization is the actual meeting of the gametes, of the male gamete and the female gamete, or the pollen and what's stored in the ovary. So that's fertilization. And the results of the fertilization will produce a seed. And that seed can get dispersed from one place to another. So take, for example, if you are a, a fruit tree, for example, and your fruit falls down to the base of the tree. Now, if nothing happens and that fruit actually degrades and the seeds end up somehow getting into the soil, that's not going to be a very ideal place for the seeds to actually grow up because this giant tree here is already has this enormous root system that's already sucking up the majority of the water and uh, sucking up the majority of the nutrients. And it's already taking most of the light. And so any kind of small fruit tree that's going to grow underneath is going to be seriously uh, impaired. It's not going to be have good access to light or water or minerals. So your best bet is try to get that seed or that fruit as far away as possible. And that's where wind can help out if uh, your seeds are specialized for wind delivery. Or uh, if it's in a fruit, then that's a delicious snack for an animal like a horse to come eat your apple. But the horse is not going to stay there. The horse is going to run around. And when it eventually does its business, it's going to drop its feces with some of those apple seeds with some special fertilizer right there already. So just a few notes. This is what I just mentioned right here. The transfer pollen from anther to stigma. Formation of a zygote from the fusion of the gametes. And the release of the seed through a fruit or through some kind of cool wind delivery mechanism. Dandelions are very cool like that as well too. What an actual seed looks like, side view, front view. I hope you like my diagrams there. Uh, there's a scar. That's kind of like the umbilical cord. Uh, no, sorry, the, the belly button. It's a scar that's left over from when it was, where it was attached to the actual ovary. The seed coat is called a testa. I think that's singular. If there's more than one, uh, I'm not going to say it. Different parts of a seed right here. Inside here, this is what determines whether a plant is classified as a monocot or a dicot. The cotyledon, that's what cot is short for, is uh, the first leaves that are actually stored inside here. And 
they contain a lot of starch stuff that the parent plant actually mm-hmm. uh, gave to it because it's not going to be able to make its own glucose through photosynthesis because it doesn't have any leaves yet so it has to use whatever energy is in here in the beginning to actually start to develop and grow so there's a seed coat um, this first part here the plumule and the radical this part is going to start growing it's going to turn in the seed shoot moving upwards and this is going to become the seed root which is going to bend and start moving downwards and then so you get this fancy development that's actually happening okay As it grows, as the seed grows, we start to see a few important parts here. I mentioned the cotyledons already, uh, monocots or dicots. If you're a dicot, you have two cotyledons in here. If you're monocot, you only have one. Here's a better diagram showing what's going on, but I like what I drew. Here we have the first leaves about to open. And up here, you can see that there's a bend in the shoot as it moves up to protect uh, the leaves as they're sprouting out, basically. That's pretty neat. What else? The stem between the cotyledons and the leaves as it's extending out here. And then down here, we're looking at the roots. The roots are going to be branching out, and you're going to get all these little root hairs for increasing surface area. That's what SA stands for over there. Uh, the seed coat is split after the water is absorbed. We should have mentioned that a little bit earlier, but we're going to see a little bit later uh, the steps that are necessary for a seed to start growing, or it's called germination. So what's necessary for germination to actually happen? And the main root is going to continue growing downwards. Depending on the type of plant, if you're a desert plant, then you may not want to send your roots too deep, but you may want to have your roots spread out over a wider area and be more shallow because you're not expecting as much rain to show up. So what exactly is needed for germination to take place? Well, according to this, I can see a little bit of water and a little bit of air and then maybe just the right temperatures. So there we go. A little bit of water, a little bit of oxygen and suitable temperatures. And this is going to vary depending on the type of plant uh, that you were talking about here. But the temperatures needed to activate some of the enzymes, perhaps. And so now let's look at the actual steps here, the events that take place during germination. So I'm guessing water is going to be one of the first things It's going to help to start off, kick off the metabolism. And then we're going to get activation of some sugars, maybe some enzymes, other things like that. Let's see what's going on. Uh, absorption of water, the cells become rehydrated, and this helps to kick metabolism into full gear. Uh, here's another hormone. So far, we've talked about a couple hormones. What were they? Auxin was a port, an important hormone in plants. Abscisic acid was an important hormone. Here's another one called gibberellin, which is a plant growth hormone, which is produced in the cotyledons. And this won't happen until uh, the, the seed actually becomes metabolically active. So we need absorption of water first. And then gibberellin starts to be produced in the cotyledons, the first uh, leaves stored inside this, the actual seed. Gibberellin is going to start the stimulation. It's going to stimulate the production of amylase, which causes the digestion of starch into maltose. So you, you know we have salivary amylase as well too. So the amylase in our mouth breaks down starch that we eat from pasta and carbohydrate type foods into maltose for digestion. In this case, the seed already had some starch stored into it, given, given, given it by the parent plant because it has to be able to start growing because it can't make its own glucose yet because it doesn't yet have leaves. So it breaks down some of that starch using the amylase that was stimulated by gibberellin into maltose. And then that maltose can now be used as an energy source. So the maltose is transported to areas that need to grow, which would be the shoot and then the roots as they're expanding, stretching up. And here's a really sad thing. If that shoot keeps growing if the seed is too deep underground and it uses all of its starch that's been stored up to grow and by the time it's used up all the starch if the shoot still hasn't peaked out over out of the ground then that's too late it's dead so actually seeds have to be planted at just the right depth they're too deep they're never going to actually turn into a, a plant because the shoot will never actually be able to put out its first leaves and start to make its own food because eventually it's going to run out of the food that was stored uh, in the actual cotyledons by the parent plant. And then finally, once the maltose reaches the parts where it's needed, it gets converted to glucose, and then it gets used in aerobic respiration to make energy or uh, to be used in construction of cell walls.
to be part of cellulose. So don't forget that plant cells are also doing cellular respiration. Plant cells, depending on where they're located, can do photosynthesis, but cellular respiration is a common metabolic process that plants share with all other uh, non-photosynthesizing organisms, like myself. <laughs>